Hello, this is the Envelope DNA Virus Tutorial presented by the Essential DB with reference Lipping Cut Illustrated Review of Microbiology by Cynthia Cornelison, Bruce Fisher, and Richard Harvey. So, here we're going to visualize the Envelope DNA Viruses. So, with the Envelope DNA Viruses, you start with the classification. Under the Envelope DNA Viruses, you have no single stranded Envelope DNA Viruses. All the envelope DNA viruses are double stranded. So we start with the classification. We have the genome type is DNA. And after the DNA, we have double stranded. And inside the double stranded, we have enveloped. Now, under the envelope viruses, we can have the hepatna viridae. We are not going to speak about it in this tutorial. So again, in the envelope double stranded DNA virus, you can have herpes viridae. And under the herpes viridae, we have the family alpha herpes viridae, which is a herpes simplex group. And under the, the alpha herpes viridae, we have the herpes simplex type 1, herpes simplex type 2, and herpes simplex type 3. Herpes simplex type 3 is also called varicella zosta virus. Now, the next one, see under the herpes viridae, viridae family, we have the subfamily which is the beta herpes virini. The beta herpes virini consists of the human, the, the herpes type, um, the herpes, the human herpes type type 4, which is also called the cytomegalovirus. We have the human herpes type 6 and the human herpes type 7. Why the last one, the gamma herpes virini, which is this is a cytomegalovirus group. In the cytohemamegalovirus group, are these, these cells are making the cells will become large in size. They are the cytomegalovirus group. Now, the, this one are the herpes simplex group. The alpha herpes gene are the herpes simplex group. The beta, the cytomegalo, and the gamma herpes gene are the lymphoproliferating group, meaning that what they are the ones that are going to cause the um, the cells of the, the blood cells to replicate more. That is why the Epstein Barr virus are shared with infectious mononucleosis, where the mononuclear cells are going to replicate more. And it's also shared with Burkitt's lymphoma, where the cell cells of the lymphatic system are going to replicate more to produce even a lymphoma. Basically, you also have a human herpes virus type 8. A human herpes virus type 8 also shared with lymphoproliferative group in gamma. And herpes virini. Why? Because it's also going to produce what is called Kaposi sarcoma. You see, all in the gamma herpes are the ones that are capable of producing cancer. Why the other ones there? No. So we have the pox viride is another family in the pox viride. So under the pox viride, we have the the vaccinia virus. The pox viride, in the pox viride, we don't have the varicella virus, no. The varicella virus is, and the varicella zoster virus is under the herpes simplex um, sub um, group. Exactly, that's the alpha herpes viride subfamily. This pox viride is having other um, um, viruses, such as the moroscum contagiosum virus. Is having the vaccinia virus and is having the variola virus. <clears throat> so this is the structure of a herpes virus. So you need to know that generally they are enveloped because you're working with envelope virus. It's having a capsid and it's having a double stranded DNA. Now on the envelope we have the Google protein spike, is it clear? And you have inside between the capsid and the and the envelope we have the tegument. <coughs> so this is the replication of the herpes viride. Now we need to know that the herpes viride is a double channel chain. So when it enters and it's enveloped, when it enters, it releases the envelope to the cell membrane, and then the capsid enters. The, cap the nuclear capsid is going to bind with the nucleus because it's a DNA virus double channel. Now since the double channel double DNA. What happened inside the nucleus now is going to the gene is going to be released into the nucleus. Now inside the gene nucleus now is going to act with the is going to act now with the um, the 
so we are going to have RNA of the host the host RNA is going to act on it to produce in immediate RNA production now in those immediate RNA production are going to produce immediate early proteins and those immediate early proteins are going to so still act like the, 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 the polymerase is going to act again on those viral DNA to produce the delayed mRNA proteins. Now, the delayed mRNA protein is going to act at the level of the ribosome and going to be transferred at the level of the ribosome to produce the delayed early proteins, which are still polymerases. Now, the polymerases are now still going to those, uh, those, late, those delayed early proteins are going to still act on the on the viral DNA to produce the late mRNA mRNAs. The late mRNAs are now going to produce the late protein which now are structural is it clear? And now the late protein which are structural now can bind now with this because this now is going to is going to replicate this now is going to be DNA replication and they're now going to bind to produce the different capsid is it clear? Now the capsid is going to move out of the nucleus to pull when it when it move out of the nucleus it takes now a envelope is it clear and now at that level now it can we can move out of the cell so that is how the herpes is going to replicate now this is an example of a herpes simplex tomatitis how they map the mouth resemble in herpes simplex tomatitis so this is herpes simplex you need to know that in herpes simplex it just produces multiple ulcers at the level of the genitalia which is painful with herpes so this is herpes simplex in the genital herpes simplex in male and genital herpes simplex in female with producing different um, 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 ulcers which are painful superficial ulcers now this is now the next one is a primary and recurring herpes simplex infection so you need to know that this is the establishment of a latent infection and this is the reactivation of latent infection. So just like um, most of the viral diseases, you need to know that the herpes infection is the is the typically going to be to be um, to occur in a latent phase. And usually the herpes like to be latent at the level of the ganglions of nerves of nerve roots. So what happens is that the virus can penetrate into the skin where it's going to replicate. So at the first point, virus penetrate the skin where it's going to replicate. When it replicate now, the virus is going to enter the cutaneous neurons and migrate to the, the ganglions where it remain there for a latent period. So this is typical for chickenpox, even with the herpes, the oral herpes and the, and the genitalia herpes. So what happens so when it enters now the ganglion in certain periods in periods where you have immunocompromisation or you have immunosuppression, the virus now can subsequently be reactivated, reactivated and then they travel from the neuron through their terminal axons to so it's going to travel from the ganglion through their terminal axons now to affect now the skin of that particular nerve root. Is it clear? So it moved till the ganglion. So it penetrated the skin and then moved till the ganglion and then affect the particular nerve root of that particular ganglion. Is it clear? So the recurrent uh, infection is going to result. So where you have that's a reactivation of the latent virus. <clears throat> So now this is the mechanism of action of acyclovir. Acyclovir is the is a very important drug that is going to affect this herpes family, basically. So this is a molecule of acyclovir. So this is how. So to, to in order to know the biochemistry of it, you can just put a, a point on it and then you visualize each of these aspects. I'm not going to explain more on that. So the drug therapy of herpes infection usually you have the first line, the second line. The first line when you have a herpes infection is usually to use acyclovir. You also the first line can be famciclovir, but the second line which is topical is pemciclovir. Is it clear? So what happens is that it helps in preventing um, the the use of it inhibits the DNA polymerase action. That's um, with acyclovir. Now we continue with the next disease now, which is the herpes shedding. So you need to know that chronic um, um, suppressive antiviral therapy. You need to know that in both men and women, pharmacyclovir treatment reduces herpes viral shedding. Is it clear? 
So you see that you have pharmacy clovis and pharmacy clovis treatment act best in men and then it is going to reduce less in women. So let's say that in case where you give a placebo in men, you see that the infection is going to still be high, but the placebo in women needs to know that the herpes infection in women is going to be much more seen as compared to that of men. So yeah, that is asymptomatic in case of asymptomatic shedding. So the women are going to be asympt having asymptomatic shedding more than that of men. But when you give from Vincovin, it drastically reduces. Now, this is the time course of varicella. <coughs> Now, this is just um, the, um, the, um, the life cycle of varicella and the period, the periodicity of varicella, basically. So you need to know that there are three main phases of varicella. The first phase is the incubation period. The second phase is the contagious period. And the, third, the next phase is the viral latency, basically. So with the varicella or the chicken pox, actually it's not a pox virus. So that's why that term chicken pox is not supposed to be used too much basically so the varicella the varicella virus is going to first start by if you have infection of the upper respiratory mucosa with virus containing droplet basically so you can have infection of the mucosa with the virus containing droplets so at the beginning when you want to uh, so when you want to have the infection at the start you have infection of the upper respiratory mucosa with viral virus containing droplets now the virus is going to spread to the lymph nodes where it's going to replicate basically at the beginning so what happened is that as i've told you before when you want to have an infection you first need to have a primary viremia and then the infection start at the level of the secondary viremia the primary viremia is just the incubation period and then the secondary viremia is when you're going to start the day to begin to have the signs and symptoms, basically. So at the beginning, varicella, though we know it as a contact disease, is going to have an infection, the upper respiratory mucosa, and also at the level of the skin. So there, at the then is going to continue with the spreading to the regional lymph nodes, and then it's going to replicate. Later on, you're going to have the virus that is going to spread at the level of the liver and at the level of the spleen. Is it clear? So when it spreads to the liver and the spleen, the liver and that's the different reticular endothelial tissues. The different reticular endothelial tissues are going to remove the virus from circulation or the virus is going to persist in circulation. If the virus persists into circulation, it's going to cause a secondary viremia. Now, in secondary viremia, now it's going to result to fever and rash formation. So that's when the rashes is going to be produced. Is it clear? So the the rash is produced not because of the primary infection of the skin, but before because of the secondary viremia. So we have infection of the skin now leads to the appearance of the vesicular rashes, which is generalized all through the body. Now the virus now can enter the cutaneous and that is the contagious phase. Now in the in the, the the contagious phase can be between 15 to 25 days. The incubation phase from 20 to 15 days. Basically, and then the latency period is after 25 days, like that. So you get the virus is going to enter the cutaneous neurons and migrate at the level of the ganglia, where it's going to enter a latent phase. And later on, if the patient has any immunosuppressive disease, the patient now is not going to have the varicella form of the disease that is generalized, but the patient is going to have the zoster form of the disease, the herpes zoster, where it's going to have the disease only on the on one nerve root. So this is appearance of chicken box lesion um, of all the stages of the at the, um, at the, the, the stage of the contagious phase of the, 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 the disease. Now this is very bad in the case of a woman who is at the level of um, at the level of um, reproductive age because chicken box has a very extreme side effect on the fetus. It can it can result to many congenital abnormalities. That's why it has to be treated in patients who are in um, um, in reproductive ages. So now these are these are examples of 
cutaneous manifestation of acute herpes zoster. You see that this manifestation follow a particular nerve root. We can say that it follow the uh, the, the, the L2 nerve root and the L3 nerve root. Is it these are vesicles that are going to erupt on the erythematous base and eventually dry and scab. So they are vesicles then that's going to develop on the erythematous base. Generally that's how a varicella resemble. So we have vesicle that is just characterized as a dew drop on a on a on a red background. That's the varicella. Is it clear? It's like a rose, a rose, a dew drop on a rose background. So that's why I said that. So you have vesicles that erupt on the edema base and eventually dry and scab, similarly like varicella um, um, rashes. The vesicles appear in the region supplied by the peripheral sensory nerve arising from the old ganglion. Is it that particular old ganglion? I think it is particularly the um, the 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 the, the, the root ganglion of 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 L2. Now. The next, the, the what are the therapies that you can use in case of varicella virus? So in first line, you can use famciclovir, valaciclovir, or aciclovir. All that is going to prevent the DNA polymerase because similarly in all the herpes um, and the herpes VD family, generally um, in the in the alpha herpes VD, you are going to have that same life cycle that we have seen above, where you have a double stranded DNA that is going to enter. Uh, where you have uh, a double stranded DNA associated that enters the nucleus, is it clear? So in this case, still since it contains DNA, it's a DNA virus. You just want to prevent the polymerization of the DNA, the replication of the DNA. You use those drugs that were shown there. Now, this is a cytomegalovirus infection, is it clear? So long section showing a typical owl eye appearance. So is it clear? So this how our appearance make me think again of another um, image on the limb or the lymphatic circulation, which is for Hodgkin lymphoma. You see, you can see also how this how eye inclusions in cases of cytomegalovirus infection, which is not the same as Hodgkin lymphoma. So now these are newborns with congenital cytomegalo disease showing hepatosplenomegaly. So hepatomegaly is shown here and splenomegaly is the enlargement of the spleen. Hepatomegaly is the enlargement of the, the liver. So we have this. So we have incidence of the central nervous system. So disease in HIV um, one infected children without cytomegalovirus infection. So this is in case so this is children infected both with hiv1 and cytomegalovirus see that hiv increases the incidence of cytomegalovirus infection so you see that when the people are not infected with cytomegalovirus in age in months you see that from zero months to 18 months at the level of 12 months and 13 months that you see um it's only at this period that cytomegalovirus increases but generally, there is no infection with cytomegalovirus when they are HIV negative. Cytomegalovirus infection is potentially increased when the patient is having HIV. Is it clear? So the incidence is going to be highly increased. And the disease of cytomegalovirus is mostly on the central nervous system. Is it clear? So cytomegalovirus infection is most in the central nervous system. Again, to prevent cytomegalovirus infection, we can use the drugs first line is ganciclovir. Here we don't use aciclovir. The first line for 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 cytomegalovirus infection is ganciclovir. Still so going to prevent DNA polymerase inhibition to 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 act as inhibition of DNA polymerase. We have sinofovir and we have foscarnet. Is it clear? So those are the diseases involved there. So congenital manifestation. Now laboratory identification of of the of this cytomegalovirus, you use ELISA. So either you can you can you can identify the virus itself. So identify the virus itself. You can do viral culture to identify the virus itself. You can do um. You can also do the direct visualization of virus by the electron microscopy or to visualize the virus itself you can do um, um, the pcr 
Is it clear? But now, to visualize the virus indirectly by using the antibiotics, you can use the immunoglobulins M, or you can use the immunoglobulins G. You can visualize the immunoglobulins M, you can visualize the immunoglobulins G. Now, to visualize the immunoglobulin M and G, you can use now the enzyme link, the ELISA, that's the enzyme link immunosorbent technique that can distinguish primary the recurring infection by demonstrating the IgG serology. You can use ELISA to visualize the different immuno. <clears throat> now this is Raziola in phantom. So now the Raziola now is among the herpes, the herpes type six and herpes type seven. Is it clear? So that is Raziola in so herpes type six and herpes human herpes type six and human herpes type seven so are the one which are involved with Raziola in phantom infection. So you have the skin which resemble like that. Is it clear? So you can have the disease is divided into two. We can have a primary disease and we can have a recurrent disease. Generally, we need to know that if you are affected the first time with the disease, the immunoglobulins that you are going to have in blood is going to be immunoglobulin M. If you are affected for the first time with the disease, it's going to be IgM. But if you are affected with uh, the second time of the disease, the second time, you are going to have the IgG, immunoglobulin G. Generally, there are five immunoglobulins, and then they summarize within the monix gamma, gamma, G, A, M, D, and E. Those are the five immunoglobulins that are present in the human body. Is it clear? And then, generally, immunoglobulin G is the one which is used in cases of infections. Is it clear? When you have recurring infection or you have you are infected the second time, is it clear? Why immunoglobulin M is when you have a primary infection, you are affected for the first time of your life. <coughs> So laboratory identification of the human herpes type 2, you use the PCR to identify them, is it clear? And the treatment now is, you can use Gansiclovir, you can use Sidofovir, and use Foscanet. So just like in the case of cytomegalovirus, see that all in the beta herpes DNA family, we use these three drugs, Gansiclovir, Sidofovir, and Foscanet. Now this is the percentage of visit of emergency department of febrile illness associated with human herpes. So human herpes type 6, you see the age in more, the highest age that it occurs in human herpes type 6 is going to be um, 7 to 8 months. Is it clear? So you see that the virus in human herpes type, you see that causes Gazula virus is going to be highly increased by 7 to 8 months. But later one is going to reduce. And then we need to know that cytomegalovirus is, um, um, is type 5. Is it like human herpes 5? So we have human herpes 5, 6, and 7. All of that in the same in the same um, subfamily, which is the alpha, which is the beta herpes in the VNA family. Now we continue with the next um, herpes VNA family, VNA family, which is the gamma herpes VNA family, is constituting of the human herpes type 8 and human herpes type 4, which is Epstein Barr virus. Now we need to know that what in human herpes type 6. You can have co-infection in case of HIV, and you have terminal HIV infection, particularly encephalitis. Is it clear? So you can have co-infection with human herpes type six, accelerate the progression of HIV symptoms. Is it clear? So if you have a patient having a human herpes type six, and then you have HIV, it's going to accelerate the symptoms of HIV. Now, <clears throat> Epstein Barr virus. This is Epstein virus. This is the pathogenesis of infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein Barr virus. So you need to know that the, the gamma herpes virginia family, virginia family, subfamily is mostly referred to as the lymphoproliferative um, uh, viruses. So they are mostly involved with replicating viruses and um, replicating the lymphatic cells. So you take an example here. We have Epstein Barr virus here. So Epstein Barr virus is going to be transmitted via saliva. Is it clear? It's going to infect the epithelial cells of the oropharynx, resulting to pharyngitis and resulting to shedding again in the virus in the saliva. Now that after infecting the epithelial cells, now it's going to infect, infect the B cells. I'm sure they are infected via the major histocompatibility um, class one uh, um, um, receptors. 
the next one is that it's going to infect now the b so you're going to have b cell prevention when you infect the b cells it does not shed up again so it shed up at the level of the of the epithelial cells after the epithelial cells now infect the b cells in the b cells now it causes a b cell proliferation basically where you have a heterophyse antibodies so it's added so you have agglutination uh, agglutinate shape and all the red blood red red blood cells so you are going to have this b cell proliferation so it's going to produce many antibodies and then the next one is that you are going to have expression of the early epstein bar virus um, um proteins is it clear? then after the expression of the epstein bar virus protein now on the on the b cells the T cells now are going to realize that the B cells are abnormal because they have those abnormal Epsilon bar virus protein on their surface. Now it's going to result now to the T cell activation. The T cell activation is going to now produce a typical lymphocyte. The lymphocyte then is going to not going to be the same in case of infectious mononucleosis, and you are going to have enlargement of the liver, the spleen, and the lymph node. Is it clear? So this is just a mild form of Burkitt's lymphoma. So it's infectious mononucleosis, basically. So occurring between a period of four to seven months, resulting in pharyngitis and lymph node and fever. But now, later you can have other malignancies. So infectious mononucleosis is not a malignancy. The malignancy which can occur is Burkitt's lymphoma, basically, which mostly occur in children affecting the chromosome eight. We can have also other malignancies like the Epstein Barr virus nasopharyngeal carcinoma. We can have the Epstein Barr virus um, infection in immunocompromised patients. <clears throat> now, the laboratory investigation for Epstein Barr virus can use the serology where you can visualize the immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin M. Now, the next one, and then you can also um, use the classic test for immunoglobulins is the the pole bunel test and is based on no specific elevation of the ig including the heterophyte antibody is it clear that is that specifically as you can with the horse and sheep red blood cells so you use the pole bunel test where you place the horse red blood cells and you place the sheep red blood cells and you place the blood of man you are going to see agglutination of the horse and sheep red blood cells it just to tell you that there are many heterophyte antibodies which are because of the B cell proliferation in case of infectious mononucleosis. Basically, so it just tell you that you can do those type of cell of, of cells are present. Also, on the blood smear, you're going to see the T cells are going to be atypical in shape. Is it clear? So you are going there. Cytotoxic T cells are typical in shape just because of the T cell proliferation. So, in case of T cell proliferation, laboratory investigation, you can see a typical T cells. And in case of um, B cell proliferation, you can use a pole brunel test where you are going to see uh, accurate agglutination with the horse and sheep. That is all with Epstein Barr virus. <coughs> Now, what is the classic clinical triad of infectious mononucleosis? So, for infectious mononucleosis, you must have three things clinically. You must have fever, you must have pharyngitis, and you must have lymphadenopathies. So, if you have fever, the patient has pharyngitis, and the patient has lymphadenopathies, usually the enlargement of the anterior and the posterior lymph nodes, just know that it's infectious mononucleosis. So, not acute infection is often asymptomatic in children whereas adolescents and, and young adults show typical symptoms of the mononucleosis, infectious mononucleosis basically. <clears throat> so what is the transmission? The transmission of infectious mononucleosis is via the exposure of oropharyngeal secretions. So clinical manifestation of Epstein, of, of Epstein Barr virus associated infectious mononucleosis by age group. So we are going to have Patients generally less than 35 years and patients greater than 35 years are shown in red. 
less than 35 years you are going to have less fever compared to more than 35 years less than 35 years you have more pharyngitis than more than 35 years less than 35 years you have more lymphadenopathies than more than 35 years in jaundice is more going to occur in more than 35 years and the rash is more going to occur in more than 35 years what is the inc the incidence of epsilon bar shared infection mononucleosis means to know that the peak incidence occur between the age of 15 to 19 years so it's not usually in children if it is more inclusive more in adolescent and or adult so the incidence is 30 times higher in black than white in the united states so infectious more inclusive more affect people of our color type blacks there is no difference in incidence between both sexes but both sexes and then 90 percent of the general population show the evidence of previous infection with epstein bar virus now we have another disease caused by epstein bar virus is hairy leukoplakia which is shown here now this is an abnormal mononuclear cell you can see these are the abnormal mononuclear cells t cells that i was speaking about on the infectious mononucleosis now this is the properties of the herpes virus family generally we have seen it we've said the herpes simplex one herpes simplex two and bicella zoster all belong to the family alpha cytomegalovirus for them subfamily is beta herpes vd epsilon bar virus is gamma herpes vd what are the clinical manifestation herpes simplex one can cause keratoconjunctivitis gingival stomatitis pharyngitis tonsillitis herpes simplex two can cause genital herpes it can also cause perianal perinatal and disseminated disease now the varicella zoster virus can cause varicella or chicken box and later on when it reactivates it causes herpes herpes zoster now if you have congenital infection in utero cytomegalovirus and also causes mononucleosis like syndrome so it can just cause just like the infectious mononucleosis in epstein bar virus and burkitt lymphoma so just like infectious mononucleosis in epstein bar virus cytomegalovirus can cause a mononucleosis like syndrome but usually the cells in cytomegalovirus are going to be larger than normal <clears throat> and they're also going to have the RI inclusions now the clinical manifestation of recurring infection so if you have a recurring infection here yeah, you're going to have a herpes labialis is it clear at the beginning you are going to have gingival somatitis here yeah, you're going to have herpes labialis it's a cold source the the if it's, it's recurring you're going to have genital herpes recurring here you're going to have herpes zosa recurring here you're going to have asymptomatic shedding of the virus and here you have asymptomatic shedding of the virus now the next is the site of initial infection usually herpes one is mucoepithelial here is also mucoepithelial here is mucoepithelial just mean that it is it can be both the respiratory tract and also at the level of the skin cytomegalovirus monocyte lymphocyte and epithelial cells and this is muco epithelial and b lymphocyte so this these two uh, can be via the skin contact and also via blood transmission now what is the site of latency it here is at the level of the trigeminal sensory ganglia that the herpes simplex lie here is going to lie at the level of the lumbar and the sacral sensory ganglia is it clear here is going to latch the trigeminal dorsal and the dorsal root ganglia is it clear and here we have monocytes so it's going to hide, hide inside the monocyte and lymphocyte is it clear cytomegalovirus is more in the monocyte lymphocyte while the epstein bar virus is more in the b lymphocyte producing those um, heterophile antibodies <clears throat> Now this diagram now is to show now smallpox. Smallpox was a very extreme disease that was in the past to, to because of it. it was a pox disease in the past, is it clear? And was caused it was a bi it was a biological weapon. So it's a potentially devastating biological weapon because it's highly contagious and a high case of fatality rate, more than 30% among the vaccinated people. But this smallpox has highly been eradicated in past period. Is it clear? So that was the that's why we are not going we are not seeing smallpox again. And so this is the cycle of smallpox. So you have 
what happens you have virus infect the upper respiratory tract and then spread to the regional lymph nodes and small blood vessels in the skin just like varicella so by the day three the patient is just like this and day five you still have this and the seven you have rashes so approximately one third of infected individuals die from bleeding from the cardiovascular collapse and secondary infection so you have one third of patients that were having um, um, smallpox were just dying so this is this so this in this period which is highlighted that is the period of rashes and this is the period of scar and most of the patients, as one third of the patient will die of bleeding disorder, cardiovascular collapse, and secondary infection. So, this smallpox was a high devastating disease. And it's among the pox family, the pox virginia family that was shown down there. So, from here, we are finished with the first service part of the tutorial. Say thanks for your kind attention. Don't forget to like and subscribe for our channel. Thanks very much.